And we'll, if you turn with me tonight to Matthew chapter number 26. And there's a lot tonight that we could look at. And my goal is not to be lengthy. My goal is to be precise and just looking to the Word of God, particularly as we're looking at Bible study. But I want us, as we're getting ready to head toward Easter, I want us to look at the events of everything. You know, Palm Sunday, I, I brought our attention to um, the events of the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And then when Sunday comes, we're going to be celebrating a resurrected Savior. So I feel like tonight I'd like to just look at those events leading up to the crucifixion of Christ and Christ being crucified and what that means to us. Uh, I'm going to read some, dissect some, look at the Word of God, maybe jump because I'm not going to have time to look in great detail at everything. And uh, if you were tonight to look at John's Gospel, uh, where I'm going to start out, John gives us a little more information than what Matthew does, but I just felt drawn to Matthew tonight to, to look at. And the Bible talks in Matthew 26, verse number 7, speaking of a woman named Mary, having an alabaster box of precious ointment, and she poured it upon his head as she sat at meat. While, while he was yet alive, she was anointing him. And there's something to be said of that because she's seen the value. There's faith there that he is the sacrifice. Uh, as we read on, the Bible says, but when the disciples saw it, they had indignation. Or uh, their complaint, it originated, when we look at John, he tells us it originated from one man. Who was that one man? Who was the frustration? And, and, I'm sorry, Judas. And we know that he was the, 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 the money holder. We know that what was in his heart, he was going to portray Jesus. So there was something to be said there of his value of Christ, of his value of the anointing, of his value of, of looking at Jesus as, as the sacrifice. The Bible says, and when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For the, the atonement might have been sold for much more and given to the poor. Understanding that what she was uh, giving here uh, in 2003, it was worth about $12,000. This was a very costly this was a great price. And, but, but Jesus said something to him. He said, you are always going to have the poor with you, but you're not going to have me to look at or to touch and to feel. And so he was showing the value of who he is. And uh, he said, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why do you trouble this woman if she has wrought a good work upon me? Amen. He is already looking at Calvary. He's already looking at his death and, and knowing the price. And she understands the value of my death. Do we understand the value of the death of Jesus Christ? That because of his death, it changes history. It changes hearts and lives. It changes eternity. God has sent him to be the sacrifice for sin. And so uh, he goes on now to say uh, 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 that you're always going to have the poor with me. Uh, uh, verse number 12. For in that she has poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. She believed in the death, and not only the death, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of all who should have known, the disciples should have known and understood, but this woman had a greater faith. Could it have been because of her experience with Christ? Amen. But her faith in Christ is great. And he said, Verily, verily, whatsoever, whosoever, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman has done, be, uh, be told uh, for a memorial for her. He is saying, listen, 2,000 years later, 
Amen. Hey, here in America, we're not the church. The story of what this lady has done is going to stand for a memorial, a memorial of faith and a Savior who is crucified and is resurrected. Then we jump down on verse, uh, verse number 14. Uh, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest, and we know that he is, he is working the betrayal. And the Bible says, now uh, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, 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 he is going to be celebrating Passover. When you look at the Jewish calendar, Jesus actually is celebrating, from what I can read and understand, Passover on Thursday, not on Friday, because he's going to be the Passover lamb on this Passover. It's going to be a different Passover than ever has been before. And so here it is. The disciples came unto him saying, where were you uh, that, that we prepare for you to eat Passover? And uh, the Bible says, uh, now imagine it's about 1,500 years they have been celebrating celebrating Passover. Then coming out of, of Egypt, of the, 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 the land that was slain, Brother Doug, they celebrated 1,500 years. But Brother Justin, this year is going to be different because Jesus Christ is about to change Passover because He's becoming the Passover Lamb. And he said, go into the city uh, to such a man. Now, some folks believe that this, the, the writer John Mark of, 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 of John uh, that believe that, that, that it was John Mark's father. We do not know that, but tradition would, would tell us that. Amen. And say unto him, the master says, my time is at hand. Meaning that uh, 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 there's... there's He's about to be crucified. I will keep Passover at your home with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Uh, and I'm, I'm moving kind of quickly for the sake of time. There's a lot that I could and wanted to say, but uh, need to be cautious. Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. I want you to realize that we're, I said he's celebrating early. It, it is early in some regards, but it's already Passover because evening has come at 6 o'clock. And so now on the Jewish calendar and the way that they work is the next day has started. Our clock strikes 12 and then it's the next day. For them, it's sundown is their next day. And that's important for us to remember because I'm going to share something with you a little bit later that's very important as we look at the death, the, uh, the crucifixion, and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So even though we look, he's, he's, he's beginning preparations a day early, but, but it's on Thursday, but it is Passover because the sun is down. So my, most would think that it's around 6 o'clock here. And so... Um, uh, and, and, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say to you, that one of you shall betray me. And uh, this is what I love. We sang this tonight. He knows. He cares. Jesus does know. And Jesus does care. And Jesus was given Judas Iscariot another opportunity, another chance. Could have been different. God in compassion and love. And he had given Judas a chance after chance, after chance. And Judas could have even repented after this and God would have forgave him. But because of the shedding of innocent blood, it was too much for him. And we know that he took his life. The Bible says, and they all the disciples were exceedingly sorrowful, and they began to say, whoa, whoa, uh, 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 unto him, Lord, it is I. It is it I? They didn't know it was Judas. They were all thinking, could it be me? Uh, they didn't suspect, suspect Judas in the least, but and he answered it, and he said, Whosoever dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of God, uh, man goeth as it is written uh, uh, of him. Uh, the prophets had said this, but woe, unto, uh, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been, uh, for it had been good for that man if he had not been born. You know, we look at Judas and we say, wow, Christ says it would be better for him had he not been born than be in the situation. But let me reframe this for a moment. What he's saying isn't just a Judas. 
but it's for every unsaved person who dies and goes into eternity. It would have been better if they had not been born than to die and go to hell. God's compassion is great. And God is not willing that any should perish. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Life can be lived purposefully when we live life for Jesus Christ. That's where we have to change our mindset. Jesus, the reason why I live is you. The reason why I am is you. You are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. It is best for me. I didn't ask to be born. So God, I don't know how to live. Did any of you ask to be born? Any of you in here asked to be born? But God created us. None of us asked to be born. And if I didn't ask to be born, then how do I know how to live? But in Jesus Christ, show me how to live. Because God, I don't want my life to be as if I should have never been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, You have said. Probably even others didn't hear. And then he did what we know of as the Lord's Supper or Communion. And he broke bread. He broke the bread. Can you imagine what this upper room was like as Jesus broke his bread? And he was saying, I'm showing you that symbolically tomorrow I'm going to be this is my body, which is broken for you. He said, take heat, this is my body. The action shows that he gave Calvary to the whole wide world. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to him and said, drink, for this is my blood of the New Testament. There's a new covenant. The Passover lamb does not prevail. But the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, is creating a new covenant of grace. It is for the remission of sins. For all of you Manatee. And then he said, I will say unto you that I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And then they sung a hymn and they went out. Most think that the hymn was Psalms 115, Psalms 118. I'm not going to read all of that, but I just want to read as they sing. They sing, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say His mercy endures forever. Amen. Let them who now who fear the Lord say His mercy endures forever. I called upon the Lord in my distress and He answered me. And He, and he set me in a large place. Amen. Thank God. Amen. As they sing, amen, they're thinking about the mercies of God. And they don't even understand the great mercies and the grace that they're going to see. They're going to be like sheep that scatter. Amen. But they're going to come back and know that this is the the mercy of God and the grace of God has worked for their good. Peter's denial was told. He's very boastful. He said, I'll never offend you. I'll, I'll never, I'll never deny you. You know, it's easy to be prideful. The Bible says that pride cometh before destruction, the high spirit before fall. Amen. And so here is this boastful Peter. But thank God for His grace and mercy. Let's move on quickly. We come now from that 
that Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to refer to it as, and they come to the garden, a place called Gethsemane. And the older I get, the more I love to understand Gethsemane. Because I truly believe each of us have to have a Gethsemane experience. Each of us have to have a Gethsemane experience. And so, he said unto his disciples, he said, sit here while I go and pray yonder. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, Peter, James, and John. And he began to be sorrowful and heavy. It's tremendous stress. It's tremendous pressure. Many reasons why that is. I'll talk more about that threefold reason. I've often referred to the venomous cup that he'll drink out of sin. But, but let me add a little more to that this evening if I could. And uh, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. And he went a little farther. I love those words. And he went a little farther. What was happening in Gethsemane was this, is that Jesus came with a purpose and plan that he was born to die. But as he went to Gethsemane, he said, God, I need your grace and your strength. I need just to be completely surrendered to the will of my Father. I'm in the flesh. I'm struggling with the flesh. And he went a little farther. Can I just ask us this question? Has any of us went a little farther in prayer? Where there's a struggle and we pray, but the struggle's not over. But as Jesus did, he went a little, he prays harder. He prays more intently. He falls and he gets back up and he falls again under the weight of this prayer. He went a little farther. When we feel like we're still struggling with that, which we prayed for, and we, we feel like we're struggling to, to have the victory, to struggling to get over the temptation. Amen. I think that we should take the example of the model of the Son of God. God, and we need to go a little farther. And that may mean that there may be not be anybody else around. That may be us going by ourselves. Amen. Where we are with God the Father. And we say, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Getting rid of everybody else. And it can be intense. It can be physically intense. It was for Jesus. And he went a little farther. The Bible says that he fell on his face and he prayed. And he said, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Threefold. He was going to be facing the penalty of all humanity. The penalty of the punishment for sin for all of humanity. He was going to be separated from God the Father. Father could stand to see it. And then he was going to experience death. Let this cup pass from me. I want to tell you something. You and I will never experience what Jesus experienced. We'll never be separated from the Father. Because even in the middle of death, the Father is with us. We'll never know the penalty of sin because... Christ has taken it for us. We'll never know death and the sense of dying, that spiritual death, because Jesus already made a way for us. And so the Bible says that he came unto the disciples and he found them asleep and he said, Peter, why could you not tarry with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Bible says he went away again the second time. Oh, my Father, if this cup, if, if this cup may pass from me, uh, uh, except I drink it, your will be done. He was totally surrendered to a will of the Father. Are we totally surrendered to the Father's will? Not my will, but that will be done. 
Didn't Jesus teach us that in the model prayer? Not my will, but thy be done. The Bible says they came and found them asleep. Their eyes were heavy. And he lifted them and went away. And he prayed a third time, saying the same words. He went a little farther. He prayed again. What a struggle it can be to get our life in alignment to the will of the Father. But the only way that we'll do it is alone in prayer. I'm jumping on down. We know the story that Judas comes and he shares that the one whom he kisses is the one whom he betrays. He kisses Jesus. They take hold. We know uh, not from Matthew's Gospel, but once again from, from John's that it was Malchus. Uh, uh, Peter cuts off his ear. And, and so uh, he says, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. We'll never, never, never spread the Gospel of Jesus Christ by a sword. It will only be done through the Spirit of God and the love of God and serving God. And so he was saying to Peter, it's not going to happen this way. You're not going to build my kingdom this way. And he takes the ear of the man and he puts it back on and he heals him. The very last earthly miracle that we see Jesus do. And he did, did it to those who, who despised him and did him wrong. God help me to learn from your example that no matter what others do to reach out love and compassion and expect the best for them. So... As, as we move forward, we see the trial that happens. We see Peter's denial. Jesus sent to Pilate, Judas kills himself. Jesus is condemned. Barabbas is released. Everything transpired. We find verse number 27 of chapter 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto them the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had platted a crown of thorns, it's called the victor's crown, the victor's thorns. Oh, John, we're talking about this. Those thorns, from my study, can reach up to six inches in length. And they took that crown of thorns and they placed it upon the head of Jesus. They stripped him of that scarlet robe. They put a reed in his hand, they bowed before him, and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Sister God, as you said, the most disgusting thing they begin to spit upon him. And they took their ring and they smote him on the head. And when they mocked him, they took their robe from off of him. And they put on his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. There's a lot of thought about what the cross looked like, how it was. You can research that. Jesus was in no condition because most that was crucified by Roman crucifixion was forced to carry their own cross, or at least the cross beam of that cross. But Jesus could not do so because his body had been beaten. Not able to bear it, so they called a stranger, son of Sari, and they compelled him to bury his cross. Probably weighed around 100 pounds, most Bible scholars say. He carries his cross. We're Simon. We're the stranger. Would you carry his cross? If you were looked at and compelled, and you are, will you carry the cross to prayer? 
Christ. And as he went down that Via del Rosa, as he went toward Golgotha, the place of the skull, they gave him vinegar, mingled with gall. He tasted thereof, but he wouldn't drink. And there at the cross, they cast the lots and they parted his garments. Crucifixion meant that his clothes was taken off of him. The only thing that was probably on him was a loincloth. He hung there in shame. Crucifixion was just, I look at diagrams of how the nails this week went through his arms and through his feet. Now how that the pulling, you would try to push up to relieve the pressure on his lungs, but it would pull at his feet, pulling at his hands, and there in the sun. But yet, in the middle of it all, one rallying out and cursing him, but another reaching out in faith, saying, will you forgive me? I deserve to be here, but you do not, and you forgive me. Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Our proper place is hell, but because of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he gives us heaven. He said, you who destroy this temple and build it in three days, if you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And he could have, but he couldn't, because he came with a purpose and plan. There it was around noon, the Bible says, that the sky grew dark in the noonday. And then about the ninth hour, he cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We know the final words he said is, it is finished. The work of Calvary is finished. The blood of Jesus has been spilt punishment for sin, a debt that is so large that none of us in our lifetime could ever pay it off. He paid off the debt for every human, uh, human uh, that would ever live and uh, uh, ever. He, he paid the debt of sin. And so they took him down from the cross. They prepared his body. They laid him in a borrowed grave. It was a new tomb in which never man had been laid before. So there it was on Friday that they laid him, realizing that he dies 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He is placed in the grave. And as he dies, we know that the veil of the temple was rent, the earthquake. Those who died in faith prior Amen. Their graves have changed. And so, as he is buried, the Bible says that Joseph of Arimathea, that rich man, he went to Pilate, he begged the body. He had taken the body down from the, cloth, the cross, he wrapped it in linen cloth, and he laid it in that new tomb, which he had given out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone at the door of the sepulchre and departed. So here it is. And here's a bunch of hell three days later, but it doesn't make sense. Can we jump back to that whole aspect of me talking about when the day changes for those of Jewish custom? It doesn't line up with our custom. But he's laid in the grave on Friday before sundown, so it counts as day number one. All day Saturday, he's there. 
And I'm using our Saturdays to help us understand. But I'm using their custom so it can be clear in our mind. And then very early in the morning, day number three. So you may look and say, how can it be Friday? And then we say three days Saturday. Because if you say, uh, if, if it would have been Monday, it would have been four days. So you look at Friday because it was still the day. Amen. You look at Saturday, which is the complete day. And then Sunday, which is early in the morning, becomes the third day. Amen. And he promised just as as, as, as Jonah was in, 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 in the big fish's belly three days. He said, you destroy this temple in three days. So everything, even looking at Esther, amen, the three days in Esther, it all brings alignment and clarity to understanding the three days. And the Bible says that very early in the morning, as it began to dawn, it's the day, it's a new day, King Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to the seventh curve. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel descended from heaven. And I want to stop there, because we'll talk about Easter on Sunday. So, as we're walking through our week, think about the fig tree tomorrow. Think about him getting ready for the Passover. Think about on Thursday, that last supper. Think about Friday, his crucifixion. Saturday, think about him being in the grave. And Sunday, we're going to come and celebrate a risen Savior. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Something that stands out to them?